For as long as I have known him, Jake has been obsessed with hiking. Personally, I have trouble understanding the appeal of being out in the woods. Don't get me wrong, I'm not some sunlight-hating shut-in who loathes the outdoors, but being out in the middle of nowhere fills my mind with images of all the things that could go wrong. That's actually why I first agreed to go with him. I didn't want to be sitting at home wondering if he was lost and alone out in the woods somewhere. I will admit that our hikes are actually pretty enjoyable, but it's mainly because Jake is a great person to hang out with. Honestly, I'm not sure why he never became some kind of nature guide. He'd be brilliant at it. Once we were out on the trail, he has a way of making me forget all about my anxiety. He points out the various species of birds, tells the cheesiest nature puns, and somehow he always finds the best spots to take a moment and just appreciate our surroundings. I never should have agreed to go on our last hike. But as they say, hindsight is 2020. Jake called me up late one Friday night, very drunk, going on and on about some trail he heard about from a guy at a bar. They'd been chatting, and Jake inevitably brought up his favorite topic, hiking. It didn't matter if he was completely plastered, Hiking was always on Jake's mind. This guy claimed he knew about a great trail that wasn't well known, but had some stunning scenery. He wrote down directions on a napkin, and Jake wanted to know if I was down to check it out in the morning. I knew Jake was going to be hungover, and I would have to do all the driving, but there was no way I could let him go on his own. The sensible thing would have been to talk him out of going and put it off for another day. But once Jake gets excited about something, it's no use arguing with him. I told him to count me in. We pulled into an empty parking lot around 10 the next morning. We'd normally be on the trail by then, but the strange glyphs crudely scrawled out on a beer-stained napkin weren't the easiest to follow so he didn't quite make it there as early as planned. The lot only had two spots, so I took the one on the left and hopped out of my car. My prediction about Jake's hangover was spot on, and the car ride hadn't helped him out. He stumbled out of the car and onto his hands and knees. I turned away as I knew what was coming. When I looked back over at Jake, he was staring very intently at something. What is that? He held something out to me. I found it on the ground. It was a dirty Polaroid picture that looked like it had been lying on the ground for quite a while. It showed two girls standing at the mouth of the trail, smiling at the camera. The one on the left had blonde hair tied back with a bandana and was wearing a red tank top, while the other girl was a redhead wearing a light blue t-shirt with her arms stretched out toward the camera. I handed the photo back to Jake. I guess they must have hiked the trail and dropped this. Had to have been years ago though. I mean, who even takes Polaroids anymore? Jake stared at the photo for another moment before sticking it in his pack and we got ready to head out. At first there wasn't much of a note about the hike. The trail was a bit overgrown but otherwise similar to most of the others we had traveled. We had been going for about 30 minutes when we came upon some rocks perfectly shaped for sitting. Jake objected to taking a break so soon especially after our late start. He was still nursing his hangover, and I wanted to get some water in him. He took a few swigs from his canteen and handed it to me. As I took it from him, I noticed something under his foot and leaned over to yank it free. 
It was another Polaroid. This time, the photo was taken from behind a person who looked to be the red-haired girl from the first photo. She was walking up the trail, and I was pretty sure I could make out the very rocks we were resting on up ahead. She was in the first photo, too. Jake was leaning toward me, peering down at the photo. Why did they leave these behind? It's strange that these photos were just left lying around. It did seem strange, but I figured it was only two photos. Anyone could have accidentally lost one or two out of their bag. Jake stuck the Polaroid with the first one, and we kept moving. We made our way further down the trail, and I found myself wondering why exactly the guy Jake met at the bar had been so into this place. It was pretty unremarkable, other than a feeling of unease that I couldn't seem to shake. It almost felt like I'd walked to this trail before, even though I was sure I'd never been there before. Jake was in front of me, only half paying attention to the trail, flipping through some notebook. I wondered aloud, mostly to break the silence. What exactly did that bar guy think was so great about this place? The question went unanswered. Jake was completely fixated on his notebook. A bit further down the trail, I took another short break as Jake continued reading his book. I took a moment to survey the surrounding trees. I had begun to zone out when my gaze landed on a large rock a good ways off the trail. I almost missed them at first, but there, at the base of the rock, were two figures huddled close together. My eyes focused on them, and I was sure it was the two girls from the photos. They looked terrified, and had their arms wrapped around each other as they frantically looked around them. Suddenly, Jake placed a hand on my shoulder, and I just about shit myself. Let's keep moving. Sorry for making you wait. I nodded at him and looked back at the rock, but nothing was there. Jake's notebook was gone, but the silence still hung around. Nothing had happened, but a sullen atmosphere had built up around us. It must have been getting to Jake too, because he spoke up. Holding on to those below, new things helped with letting go. What? I gave him a questioning look. He had caught me off guard, and I wasn't sure what he was saying. The guy, the one that told me about this place. That's what he said. Holding on to those below, new things help with letting go. Well, that is actually creepy as fuck. You really were drunk if that made you think coming here was a good idea. Are you sure he isn't out in the woods following us? A feeling of being watched crept over me, and I regretted saying it immediately. Something feels off here. None of the other places we've gone felt like this. It seemed like Jake was going to say more, but at that moment we came upon another Polaroid. This one stapled to a tree. He pulled it down and we both took a look. It was the blonde from the first photo, holding a map and pointing off into the woods behind the photographer. There was dirt smeared across her face and her expression was one of trepidation. She was obviously lost. The first two photos had been innocent enough, but not only was the content of this one worrying on its own, someone had fucking stapled it 
to a tree. But we should call it a day, Jake. You know, I hate scary shit, and this is fucked up. Plus, she is definitely lost. We need to report this to someone. His eyes were stuck on the photo, and I could tell it was affecting him. Maybe more than it was me. It's probably some kind of prank. We'll just look like idiots if we bring this to the cops. Just don't let it get to you and enjoy the hike. Jake added the photo to the growing collection in his bag and started moving without waiting for a response. There was no way he thought this was just a prank, but he didn't seem to want to talk about it. The feeling of being watched intensified. I thought I had just psyched myself out earlier talking about bar guy following us into the woods, but the feeling had become palpable. It was wrapped around me, weighing me down, yet pushing me forward as to not be left behind. After the third photo, Jake didn't say anything and paused only a few times to scan the woods around us. I was feeling stressed out, and Jake was scaring me. I'd never seen him like this before. He claimed it must be some kind of prank, but the photos made him more determined to keep moving. After what felt like hours, he finally stopped. There. He had a finger raised, pointing out between the trees. I followed his finger to see what he was pointing at immediately spotted it. Between the trees, I could make out something large and white, but I wasn't sure exactly what it was. It seemed like bad news, though. I have no idea what that is, but can we just get the fuck out of here? Nothing about today has felt right. I swear, I'm not going on any more hikes if we don't turn around right fucking now. The words came out sounding much harsher than I had intended, but the situation was really getting to me. Jake stood there for a moment, probably considering how he was going to respond before looking at me. I will turn around and go back with you, if you go check out whatever that is with me first. Otherwise, I'm going to continue down the trail with or without you. He was serious, and it pissed me off. Really? That's how you're going to play this? God, fuck you, man. Why do you even need to go check it out? You know I'm not going to walk back to the car alone. So this isn't really a choice. He didn't back down. Fine. Let's just get this over with. He turned back towards the trees and stepped off the trail. I followed behind him, periodically glancing over my shoulder, trying to pick out landmarks to find the way back later. Jake didn't seem as concerned as he picked up his pace, moving closer to the thing in the woods which I can now see was an old house. It was run down and looked like no one had occupied it in decades. Definitely the last thing I wanted to be investigating in these woods. Jake stopped at the base of the stairs, leading up to the front porch, and looked down at something. He'd put a bit of distance between us in his rush to get there, so it was a moment before I caught up and saw that he was staring at the back of another picture, lying on the first step. He seemed to be afraid of what it might have to show us. I realized I was holding the photo without even being aware I had picked it up. The same girls were pictured from the waist up, standing in front of a concrete wall. Their cheeks were streaked with tears. 
I realized I'd never seen anyone truly scared until I saw that photo. In the space between them, just visible at the bottom of the photo, was what looked like a burlap sack. Holy fuck, Jake. Look at this. What the hell happened to them? Who took this photo? He took a look before responding. They might be in the house. That looks like a basement. We have two just like they did. I thought I could do it, but I can't ask you to go in. One for one will have to work. He started up the stairs. Jake, what are you talking about? We have two? I don't know what is going on, but we need to get out of here. He ignored me and continued forward. This is what everything has been for. I can't turn around. I'm sorry for lying to you and bringing you into this. I want you to take this just in case. He pulled out his notebook and tossed it to me before flashing one last smile and disappearing through the door. It wasn't making sense anymore. I knew I couldn't let him go alone, and I swear I tried to follow him, but my legs just wouldn't move. Instead, I put his notebook in my bag and waited. I stood there for at least 20 minutes, but there was no sign of Jake. Not even a sound. The worry for my friend eventually overpowered the fear holding me in place, and I made my way up the stairs and stepped into the house. The moment I crossed the threshold, I could feel the air get heavier. It became difficult to breathe. A long hallway stretched out before me. The floor was a dark hardwood, and the walls were papered with some swirling, purple design I could barely make out through a thick covering of grime. Cobwebs were strewn across the hallway, and a layer of dust coated the ground. Jake would have headed to the basement, looking for those girls. So I took a deep breath and started down the hallway to look for stairs. I moved through the house in my search for any sign of the basement, assuming there was one, avoiding the old furniture that was scattered all around, falling apart and blanketed in filth. Each time I took a step, I heard footsteps matching my own echoing from above. I did my best to ignore it hoping I would find the stairs down before stumbling upon the stairs up. I'd made my way through the parlor and dining room when I came upon the kitchen. On the opposite wall from where I entered, a door hung ajar, revealing a dark staircase leading down. I called out hoping to get an answer from Jake, but the only response was silence. I was left with no choice but to head into the basement. With each step I took toward the door, I could feel my anxiety and fear grow. I was envisioning all the horrible scenarios of what was going to happen when I went down those stairs. I made it about halfway through the kitchen, legs wobbling as if they could no longer hold my weight when I heard Jake call my name. He sounded distorted, as if he was screaming through a fan. Hearing his voice got my body moving, and I dashed across the kitchen and down the stairs into the basement. I found myself in a big empty space. The floor and the wall by the stairs were made of concrete and the only sources of light were a few bulbs hanging from the ceiling, 
although I wasn't sure how the house had working electricity. One concrete wall may not be easily distinguished from another, but this had to be where the last photo we found had been taken. Even with the lights, it was hard to make out my surroundings, so I was cautious as I began to walk forward. I could just barely make out dark spots on the ground and try not to think about what they were. About a dozen steps away from the stairs, I felt my foot land on something and reached out, finding a burlap sack. As I was inspecting the bag, a flash went off no more than a few feet in front of me. My heart began pounding hard against my chest. I couldn't make out anything in the darkness, but something was obviously there. I moved forward, doing my best to stay quiet and not draw the attention of whatever was in that basement with me. The only thing that kept me moving was the need to find Jake. I could barely make it out, but on the floor in front of me was the white outline of another Polaroid, confirming what the flash had been. I felt tears flowing down my cheeks. I had realized just how terrified I was. It was too dark to clearly see what was in the photo, so I headed back toward the stairs. My mind was conjuring up all manner of creature looking in the darkness, watching my every move. I made it to the bottom of the staircase and dashed up to the kitchen, shutting the door behind me and sinking to the floor. After letting everything process for a moment, I looked at the photo. I knew I wasn't going to like what I saw, but that photo will forever haunt my nightmares. The scene mirrored the photo we'd found outside the house, except in this one, wide, unnatural smiles spread across the girls' faces, and their cheeks weren't streaked with tears, but with blood that flowed out of the hollow pits where their eyes had been. I glanced at the bottom of the photo, but my brain didn't want to accept what was there. The burlap sack from the previous photo was replaced with the terrified face of Jake, gagged and looking toward the camera. I have a hard time recounting the exact details of how I made it out of those woods. But what I do remember is running. Running out of the house, running to the trail, running back to the parking lot. I never knew just how long and how hard I could run until pure fear was fueling me. My lungs were on the verge of bursting when I reached the car collapse into the driver's seat, bawling my eyes out. In the weeks following my return from the woods, I was questioned by the police about Jake's whereabouts. I couldn't include all the details, but what I told them was mostly the truth. Jake had gone inside a house in the woods and never came back out. Rescue workers searched for him, but even with the directions we had followed, they couldn't find the house, the trail, or even the parking lot. With no evidence and no motive for me to have hurt Jake, the police eventually backed off. By that point, I was certain I had lost my mind, and the guilt of leaving my friend behind had been eating away at me. I spent a long time locked up in my apartment before I finally went through my bag from that day. It wasn't until I pulled it out of my bag that I remembered Jake had given me his notebook, just in case. 
The book was filled with notes on the trails I had hiked with Jake. He had collected information on strange events and missing persons cases for every trail we had hiked. I flipped through the pages and found the entry on the final trail we'd hiked together. Jake originally learned about the place from an online forum dedicated to the paranormal and unexplained. A user posted asking if anyone could tell them more about the holding house. Jake had copied down the reply of a user named In the Woods. The holding house lies deep within the forest. Its name is pretty straightforward. It is called the holding house because it holds on to those that are unfortunate enough to wander inside. It isn't easy to find, but you wouldn't want to go there anyway. At the entrance of the trail leading to the house, you will find some sign of victims that have come before. It is the house's way to lure in the curious. If you are foolish enough to follow the trail, you will come across several more sides before the house eventually appears somewhere far off the trail. I have yet to hear of anyone that has gone farther than that and made it back to share the details. And the story goes that if you bring all the signs the house left and head inside, it's possible to trade places with those it holds. A group of four can enter the house to trade places with another group of four. If you don't follow the rules though, you'll become another part of its collection, the latest victim of the holding house. Below, the form user's reply was a memo. In the woods, the cast iron bar, Friday, 9.30, along with the same rhyme Jake had told me in the woods. Holding on to those below, new things help with letting go. I flipped through the last few pages and almost missed the Polaroid glued to the inside of the back cover. On the bottom of the photo were two names, Emma and Jake. And below it, Jake had written, Never Forget. Depicted in the photo was Jake, looking much younger with a smile on his face and an arm around a girl I recognized immediately. She had long red hair and I'd seen a photo of her in the woods the day I left Jake behind. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you want to see more, let me know in the comments below, and tell me what you thought of this narration. Make sure to follow me on Twitter for updates, and if you'd like to get early videos, shoutouts, and much, much more, I'd appreciate it if you check out my Patreon page. It's a place where you can help support my channel while getting awesome rewards in the process, and every pledge helps out a ton, no matter the size. So if you'd like to see all the rewards I offer and consider becoming a patron, it'd mean a ton to me if you'd click the link in the description and just check it out. And don't forget to show some love to the amazingly talented authors who make these narrations possible. Have a good night, everybody. Cheers.